So without any further uh, comment, I'd like to turn to our first speaker, Eleni Efsathio, uh, who came to us from London rather than in, in Athens. Uh, and she didn't go to the wedding. I don't understand this. You, what, she passed through London yesterday morning and didn't see the, the ceremony. We all saw it. It was great. But uh, Eleni, thank you very much for coming. You, she's going to uh, discuss this complexity of, of androgen signaling and prostate cancer progression. Good morning. And I would like to thank SCO for inviting me and having me here. Really, what a timing. I actually commented on it. How would we know, or how did you know? Two days ago, Zytiga, as we call it now, we're going to keep calling it Aparadron probably for today, got approved from the FDA. Great timing to talk about antigen signaling and prostate cancer progression comes hand in hand with complexity. So exploring the complexities of antigen signaling and prostate cancer progression. Great time, 12 months, three drugs FDA approved. We might as well be looking into early retirement or different line of business quite shortly, hopefully. This is a solid tumor therapy paradigm that all us medical oncologists have been trained with. Any therapeutic agent that is effective in the far advanced disease state should work in the earlier disease state. But that should actually be interpreted through the biology underlying the disease. And does that in fact apply to prostate cancer? With regard to chemotherapy, we're not really sure. We're not sure that it will work as well as it did in breast cancer and colorectal cancer and bladder cancer or other cancers to that matter. But what we do know that it should apply for some type of treatment. And we have a robust body of evidence that suggests that while, and this is a graphic representation of actually the progression model that I would like to propose based on this data and some clinical data that is forthcoming with regard to prostate cancer, but as this disease is in fact progressing from physiology to epithelial dysregulation and then to become the meaningful cancer, it actually goes through an extensive period of microenvironment dependence. And if we were to actually pick a pathway that would be at the center of this microenvironment dependence, I think we would all advocate today that that might be antigen signaling. So right along these lines, we would advocate also that elucidating the links of antigen signaling to milestones of prostate cancer progression will serve as the foundation for individualized microenvironment micro targeted therapy development to be distinguished from drug development where we've actually been quite successful these past few years. So the topics I will briefly touch upon are antigen signaling, of course, in this advanced state mainly the interface with a few tumor microenvironment pathways very briefly and the implications for therapy development. This is the dogma that has been heavily challenged and now we actually know that no, following gonadin and adrenal ablation of testosterone production, it is not only androgen independent pathways that lead to the progression of the disease. We have evidence that the microenvironment heavily participates in the progression pathways involved. This has to do with the microenvironment production of steroid metabolites and also the AR overexpression and its <coughs> interface with, with the microenvironment, the paracrine relationship. So if we actually were to place the transition of antigen signaling somewhere in the progression of the disease from the early cancer that's probably not meaningful onto the invasive disease onto the metastatic disease and finally the lethal disease, we would probably put this transition somewhere in this red box, just to be very broadly. And this could be considered as a simplistic view of life because regardless of the temporal heterogeneity of the disease, we have to take and keep in the back of our minds that there's also a heterogeneity within the disease that's been very well documented and we all see it in the clinic as well. So this would be another approach, graphic approach, to what we know till now and what we have some data on and we're working in the clinic with, with regard to the adaptive response of androgen signaling in cancer-resistant prostate cancer following castration and disease progression. So we know, and we're going to go through each and every one separately, that there's data for intracrine production. It has been developed in the lab for about 15 years, and now we have some correlative data to support it in the clinic. There's AR overexpression, and what have you as in mutant isoform or splice variants of AR, 
that lead to a shift of function and make aberrant antigen receptor signaling possible. And then there's that interface of AR signaling with other pathways. And there's several uh, and, and different um, uh, pathways involved, and I'm just going to briefly touch on those. Starting off with intracrine steroid biosynthesis. So we had some data in the lab, but more data has been forthcoming thanks to the development of drugs like abiraterinacetate. And we're going to talk about abiraterinacetate mainly because it's the first one in clinical development and, of course, because it was just FDA approved. Abiraterinacetate is the first in its class um, antigen biosynthesis, clean antigen biosynthesis inhibitor, let's call it that way. It is an irreversible inhibitor of C1720 lias and an inhibitor of 17 hydroxylase, 17A hydroxylase, that leads to depletion of metabolites below 17 downstream of 17 hydroxyprogranolone, thus leading to depletion of estrogens and androgens. As a result of a feedback loop, ACTH surge, will lead, of course, to an excess in Miller corticosteroids. And of course, this explained a lot of the first side effects we saw with abiraterone being used alone. Now, of course, it's being used with, in combination with low-dose steroids. And this has minimized Miller corticoid-related toxicity, not completely done away with. And now that it's rapidly coming into the clinic, we need to keep in mind that first of all, we need to brush up our internal medicine skills. This is an endocrine-related uh, reagent. We need to keep in check all the side effects that the steroids can cause, especially keeping in mind that all these patients, not all, a lot of these patients have a metabolic syndrome that goes hand in hand with this advanced disease. And moreover, quite a few of them might have cardiovascular diseases, so it's good to also keep cardiology in the loop. This is the study that followed quite a few of phase one, at phase two mainly studies, and uh, proved that abiraterinacetate is an effective reagent, confers an improvement in overall survival of about four months in the advanced disease, the chemo-treated metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer. And of course, as we've all uh, were excited to hear, the drug with the name Zytiga was approved about two days ago. While this study was ongoing, we moved on to perform one more phase two study, a translational study. A study was based on, on the principle of hematology. We actually believe that prostate cancer is very similar to diseases like multiple myeloma. It likes to be in the bone marrow, and that's the best way to go looking for it, actually biopsy the marrow. And that's what we've been doing at MD Anderson. Patients with metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer would agree to undergo bone marrow biopsy prior to treatment, while in treatment, and at progression. And we were aiming to look at the effect of abiraterinacetate on androgen signaling and look for prognosticators, predictors, candidate, of course, for outcome. We struggled a lot with maximizing the yield and keeping the cost down. We didn't do, want to do CT guided biopsies, we did CD directed. From our prior uh, experience with bone marrow biopsy, since we've been doing it for about 15 years, we knew we would get it in about 50% of the patients. This is minute cores, as you all know, and we wanted to make the most of the tissue and apply not only immunohistochemistry, but fish, and also laser capture microdissection to perform qPCR. All these exciting things that, that we translational medical oncologists like to, to perform. And we did actually predict correctly. We got tumor involvement in half of the patients at baseline. Thank God, this is an active agent, so our paired specimens were much less, about one-third, as would be expected also in hematology. You expect the regression of the bone there. And our PSA responses in this far advanced chemo-treated and multiple hormonal treatments cohort was similar to what has been reported with other phase two studies. So we were in parallel with what has been done and also the population from 301. We went on to look at androgen signaling in the marrow and we saw that the tumor did indeed, as has been reported, show an overexpression of nuclear androgen receptor in the marrow. CYP17 
was there. It was very heterogeneously. And this is looking at the tumor cells. It was also there in components of the microenvironment, but I'm not going to go into that detail. The bone marrow as for it testosterone was quite high, a little bit higher, but in correlation with the blood. And as would be expected, the bone marrow aspirate dehydrotestosterone was significantly lower than what we would see in the blood. And this is a representative uh, image of this androgen signaling in the tumor uh, on your left. You see that overexpression of uh, AR, and on your right, the heterogeneous CYP17. More importantly, what gave us uh, reason to believe that this might be a functional CYP17 is the fact that it actually does correlate with the bone marrow testosterone, its presence correlates with the bone marrow testosterone plasma by mass spectrometry, of course, assessed and not RIA that is not efficient in these castrate levels of, of androgens. To move on to the effects, uh, this we believe is the first time that we actually measured by mass spectrometry the effects on testosterone and dehydrotestosterone, not only in the blood and in the bone marrow, and we saw that soon after treatment, we did indeed get the pharmacodynamic effect we wanted, mm -hmm. testosterone completely depleted to below picograms per ml level, and this was sustained all the way up to progression, and of course the same data was reproduced for dehydrotestosterone that was very low and undetectable in some cases, of course, to begin with. Moving on to what would be a candidate predictor of outcome with regard to androgen signaling. Now, even if you look carefully at the 301 curve, the progression proportion in this case, the survival curve in that case, you will see that there's about a 30, maybe one fourth to one third of your cohort that is not going to have any type of benefit from abiraterone acetate. We believe that it is important to identify those patients early on and probably find a different way of treating them, and actually as it is important to identify the responders. And we saw that lack of one of the two components of androgen signaling, either overexpression of AR or lack of CYP17 expression, correlated with those patients that we'd like to call primary resistant. I actually borrowed that kind of term from ovarian cancer discipline. They use it for platinum. So moving on to what happens to abiraterone acetate, to, to androgen receptor expression following treatment with abiraterone acetate, what is obvious is that upon progression following protracted uh, treatment with abiraterone acetate, as you can see here, of course there's a regression eventually in the bone marrow, but you do still get this overwhelming expression of nuclear AR, unlike what was happening with the primary resistant patients. And this was corroborated from this data from assessing AR copy numbers by qPCR in laser capture microdissected tumor cells, and these were in, in far less samples, of course, given the limitations of LCM in this minute <coughs> tissue, but it is in line with the fact that those patients who had a benefit had an induction suggesting a functional AR of their AR copy numbers, unlike the primary resistant ones up here. So moving on, this actually just leads us immediately to the AR overexpression case. And I'm not going to um, elaborate on MDV3100, novel antiandrogen with a lot of promise right now in the clinic. We're anticipating to hear some good news on that phase three end as well. Dana Rathkoff is going to elaborate more. But we actually recapitulated the same type of study with MDV3100, bone metastatic disease. We're going to be presenting this data at the upcoming ASCO. We're seeing more or less identical PSA responses, but a shift in AR subcellular localization. OK, maybe this is something that we should have predicted. The preclinical data suggests that. Cytoplasmic localization, contrary to the nuclear localization of baseline in those patients with some measure of PSA decline. But moreover, what we're seeing is the opposite effect with regard to bone marrow and blood testosterone and in the periphery dehydrotestosterone. A rebound effect, a meaningful effect, an induction of testosterone within the paracrine levels, always. So in essence, more or less persistent antigen signaling driven by either the altered receptor or and the adaptive steroid synthesis is a hallmark based on this data, we believe, of prostate cancer progression and a central component of the tumor microenvironment. And we can go on to discuss during the roundtable 
how this combination would be predicted to, to impact the disease, the combination of both inhibitors. What about the interface of antigen signaling? And we know it's there from a lot of preclinical data with tumor microenvironment pathways. So some people like to call it now non-genomic AR signaling. I'm not yet convinced it's only non-genomic AR signaling, but what we know is that there is an interplay with specific pathways. I'm, I'm missing out definitely quite a few, but I just focused on the ones that have some sort of clinical development ongoing. One is sarkinase, CMET, and hedgehog, another one. And we did actually see with regard to phosphosarc, especially in the primary resistant patients following abiraterone an induction of phosphosarc. And just in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through the clinical data on SARC family kinases, but they seem to be effective in in vivo models. And as you, most of you already know, we're waiting on a phase three data of uh, desatinib in combination with doxetaxel. Moreover, Matt Smith is going to elaborate more on this CMET VGFR2 uh, inhibitor XL184, where we're seeing some amazing imaging responses that are coupled with clinical benefit, but not always coupled with a PSA response. So I would really like to hear his take on that. So it's obvious the, the microenvironment pathways, we're doing the good thing, the right thing, in, are implicated in resistance to maximal antigen ablation, and we're doing the right thing by prioritizing them for individualized therapy development. If we were to sum this up, and I'm going a little bit back in AR signaling, um, we could probably use androgen signaling to monitor disease progression. We're all familiar with that early stage in the disease that some call indolent, but it could be borderline with actual meaningful disease of the THT dependence. And probably, oh, this, this slide did not come out well as well, uh, the reduced data that we're more or less familiar with would support that, given that the actual meaningful and aggressive disease is not any longer uh, susceptible to 5-alpha reductase inhibition and is becoming more dependent on an AR signaling that's probably already transitioned into the paracrine and the dehydrotestosterone independent progression. And I, I brought the, this uh, patient case just to give food for our, our discussion to come about. This is a patient with oligometastatic disease that has been followed in the action for about 10 years. And he started off with intermittent antigen ablation, since it was his decision as well to go on six years later on to continuous androgen ablation. And then when, of course, he wasn't responding to that anymore, we started him about two years ago on abiraterinacidate, and he's still on undetectable PSA. So this just brings up the question of how early can we bring the androgen biosynthesis inhibitors in the disease? Unfortunately, eventually all these patients, like the, the gentleman I just mentioned, will progress. And we believe that there's a level of complexity that, that implicates other pathways of microenvironment dependence that are being looked at rigorously like right now. What are the implications for therapy? That the serial inhibition of such interacting pathways that are implicated in the progression in bone in combination with maximal antigen blockade to an extent that we can discuss about given the, the side effects with long-term therapy that we are expecting will definitely inform the development of therapy and will be an efficient approach to the disease. We're actually conducting such studies based on the bone biology platform at MD Anderson currently looking at the effects in the microenvironment. But before ending this uh, discussion, this presentation, I would like to acknowledge the autocrine state. It's very important. It's exactly the lethal phenotype of the disease the patient's life is taken away from that. And of course, the role of chemotherapy that Oliver Sarter is going to talk more about is very important at that stage. Now I'm borrowing a slide that Chris Logothetis likes to use, and I didn't really acknowledge it two or three years ago. I looked at it because he was insisting, and now I agree, that this disease is like CML. You go this, through this microenvironment, antigen signaling addiction, and then you go into a blast crisis. Well, I guess, it's more or less the same thing for prostate cancer. And what we need to do is elucidate those signaling pathworks, networks, pathways of addiction 
that will lead to the combinatorial microenvironment targeting and prostate cancer therapy. I would like to finish by acknowledging all our collaborators at MD Anderson, the funding agencies, pharma, and mainly the patients for all their support and patience with us. Thank you. You've touched on virtually everything that's going to happen in the next three hours, so I'm sure there are questions. Um, we'll, and we'll get at the issue of combination therapy, I think, uh, in the panel discussion. Ron. Is there, that was a great talk. Is there any evidence that patients up front are resistant to angiogen receptor uh, therapy? That is, that they're endowed with, you know, the, the right genetics to really enable them to overcome therapy up front. Obviously, you might see an initial partial response, but it, does it appear that there are a subset of patients that are hardwired in that way? And just a second quick question is, what's the link between SARC and AR? So absolutely, uh, good question. On the first one, we all know from the clinic that we have those patients who are absolutely refractory to androgen signaling and inhibition to begin with. We've tried to identify them. There's a, a lot of investigators looking at what we call the anaplastic type of disease that has different features. It's more like small cell-like features. And that's the, the uh, probably one end of the spectrum. But going back to what I was trying to be careful to mention, there's heterogeneity within the disease. And you don't really know which clone is going to rise at that end. We always need to keep that in mind. Um, going back to the SARC AR signaling uh, interaction, I believe, and a lot of work is being done by Gary Gallagher and MD Anderson and other investigators, there's probably a non genomic interaction between the two that has to do with um, SARC uh, and AR interaction. I don't have a lot of details on that, but I know that a lot of preclinical work has been going on since 2003. There's a lot of papers out there. Sure. You touched on this uh, a couple of points. So you touched on this a uh, couple points in your talk, the idea about moving these uh, novel antiandrogens earlier in therapy. And you know, one of the issues is that you, at current time, there, it's actually the FDA approval is with low dose of prednisone in order to counteract those endocrine effects. This is pretty controversial, right? There was a back and forth in JCO between Chuck Ryan and Johan DeBono. I'd like to hear your opinion on whether you absolutely need steroids. Because, you know, if we're going to put it in mental these agents for, for many years, that becomes a little bit more of an issue. Uh, I don't believe that we're going to be able to take away steroids completely. But that, of course, interferes with your work. So uh, you will have to probably tell us if we go down to, let's say, one milligram of dexamethasone or even 0.5, and just equivalent of prednisolone of 2.5 milligrams eventually, we're going to be able to do that. Will that still interfere with, with your work? I mean, immune, immunotherapy. Oliver, one. Can I ask for the, the names yes. of the questioners for the recording? Yes, Oliver, sorry. So, you know, one of the first questions I always ask when we have a new successful agent are the mechanisms of resistance. And there's been some innovative work done with the androgen receptor splice variant, which may be one mechanism. I didn't see a mention, but I wonder if you might comment on the AR splice variants in abiraterone resistance. I think I was trying to incorporate, for the purpose of this talk, the splice variants in that AR shift and becoming the promiscuous AR. That's probably what you're referring to, or, or the constitutively activated AR. And I think that that will be something that will be challenged with the novel antiandrogens, hopefully. So, Eleni, is, is there a form of the androgen receptor then that you can, you can find in resistant patients which signals independent of ligand? I believe we can. We have not been able to identify it in a clinical specimen, and that's our next okay, but Experimentally, you can show this, oh, that there are variants. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, in xenograss and, Very and interesting. Cancer. One final question. Do you look for uh, upregulation of CYP17 as a potential mechanism for abiraterone resistance? Because preclinically, that's been worked out by Steve right. Balk and others. I, uh, I think we were together during that AAICR meeting that I actually presented that data. Uh, I was trying in the interest of time to avoid that here. We actually see a transient, and we saw that also with xenografts, increase of CYP17 expression during treatment. But in those patients who actually respond following long term, one year and above, we have noted a depletion in the bone marrow tumor of CYP17. Of course, these are very limited specimens. We need to look at it more carefully. 
Thank you very much, Elaine.